Thank you. And neither will be back later, and I'm going to help her some more. <laughs> there is a group here tonight that is going to make an animal movie. And uh, this animal movie is different than other animal movies because this will be made by animals. <laughs> All the animals have pulled their residuals from the TV commercials to make this movie. The uh, cameraman will be Dick Doberman, the director, Perry Poodle, and the finance administrator will be David Beagle. <laughs> Thank you. I will now audition and act like an animal. First, a chicken. An elephant. <laughs> A Russian wolfhound. <laughs> and an an owl. A camel. <laughs> A racehorse. We see this young two-year-old who's at the peak of his skills and his talent uh, walking away from the camera after he has won an important race with the horseshoe flowers around his neck. such a great runner. He's been winning races in London and Paris and Santa Anita and, uh, and uh, Kentucky Derby. And he gets to be quite famous. He makes appearances uh, at carnivals and fairs. And his salary goes up and he gets himself an agent. And he's uh, interviewed on Johnny Carson. And also his footprint is in Grauman's Chinese Theater. And he's signed for a movie contract. He makes a couple of movies, starts drinking a little bit. There are a couple of scandals. A TV series, the drug bust and all that, and he gets into trouble and, and he gets in and out of hot, you know, hot soup and, uh, and, and he's, in, he's really in trouble. And by the time, and loses the William Morris office, everything goes. <laughs> and by the time he sobers up, he wakes up in an old hotel near an abandoned railroad station and his job is pulling a junk wagon. the end of the movie because you can tell when two letters appear into a great big WB. When I want to find out what's going on on Broadway, I don't go to the Schubert's or the Niederlanders. I go to the source. I go to Max the doorman and I say, how are you, Max? And he says, I'm 86 years old, that's how I am. <laughs> 52 years in show business. I dance, I sing, I get such a headache from dancing. <laughs> I have danced with bells in my ears. I have danced into and out of the hearts of my countrymen, because the whole country gets such a headache from the bells. <laughs> I did everything. I was an acrobat. I, Max the Acrobat, everybody knows. I could see the building, Max the Acrobat on the three posters, and I used to hold up six people. I held up, I was the understander. Six, I, I'll show you the varicose veins I got. <laughs> and I, I worked only the big time. My act didn't work the small time. I worked Moody's Connecticut. <laughs> I worked Sandstone, Minnesota. I worked Tynesville, Massachusetts. I didn't bother with the other stuff. 
And then I was in the circus. I was harassed about in the circus, and they wanted me to become an equestrian, but I wouldn't change my religion for anybody. <laughs> so I became a fire eater. I ate fire in the matinee in the evening, two shows a day. It was at the time when I was going with that pretty little girl up on the high wire. She was so cute with her little tutu, and she, we were engaged here, but then she broke up with the engagement because she said, I didn't have a flame in my heart, only in my stomach. <laughs> So I became a ventriloquist. Open your mouth. Now you're a dummy. That's the kind of work I used to do. <laughs> then I was a monologist. You know, it's a monologist. When you talk to yourself, that's called a monologist. You know what it's called? When you talk to yourself and 60 million people listen, it's called a success. <laughs> then I was a juggler. I juggled a billiard cue, a softball egg, a pumpernickel bagel, six yards, dental floss, everything fell through my fingers, the scenery fell on my head, so I became a doorman at the Palace Theater. I worked and I saw everybody. I worked, I worked with Walter Houston and Elsie Janis and Boyce and Allen and Jerry Lewis. I get a headache from Jerry Lewis. He hit me on the head <laughs> all the time. And then, then you know who is my favorite I got? I got my verse, I love very. This girl, she's my favorite, this Judy Garland. I got a picture here. But then she's on the yellow road with the little braids and the little doggy, oh, Miss Garland. When she sings, I, it's something in my throat, I don't know. Miss Garland, you made me love you. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. You made me want you, and all the time you knew it. I guess you always knew it. You made me happy sometimes. You made me sad. But there were times, dear, you made me feel so bad, you son of a gun. <laughs> you remember, Miss Garland, you were working in the Palace Theater. You were doing two shows a day, you were there for a long engagement. You used to go out in between shows and do publicity, and, and you got messages when you came back. You looked so tired, and I said, Miss Garland, go to your dressing room, lie down. Max will get you something to eat, whatever you want. You want art pastrami sandwich and white bread <laughs> with mayonnaise? <laughs> And with watercress. <laughs> Miss Garland, for you anything. Give me, give me what I cry for. You got the kind of kissing that I die for. I love you, Judy. such a beautiful romantic song that Anita sang. Do you notice that all the romantic songs are given to young and beautiful women and young and beautiful men to sing? I am not a young and beautiful man. <laughs> ha, ha, ha to you. To you. <laughs> but I am romantic. I may not look romantic, but there is a churning of romance going on inside of me. And so I will sing a romantic song. <laughs> Mr. G, would you, would you give me a full moon? Well, thank you, Mr. G. That's the nicest full moon you ever gave me. You always hurt. You love the one you shouldn't hurt at all. You always take the sweetest rose and crush it till the petals fall. You always hurt the kindest heart with a 
hasty word you can't recall. This scene shows a boy and a girl walking through the park. They are very, very much in love. In this scene, I play the boy. <laughs> So if I broke your heart last night, it's because I love you most of all. You look like a refined, intellectual, cultural, sophisticated, cosmopolitan audience. Did I leave anyone out? No. And as such, you must have attended a symphony concert. And when you did attend, you may have noticed that you only saw the back of the musical conductor. Well, I want to ask you tonight to imagine that you are a big symphony orchestra and you will be conducted by a very serious musician who just came back from a, a, a successful tour of the Philharmoniac Society. He takes his work very seriously, and as long as you are in on the scene, I'd like you to know your positions. The string section is right over there. The, the reeds, the clarinets are over there. And uh, excuse me for the expression, the, the contrabassoons are directly front center. <laughs> the house lights dim. The musicians are tuning up as the beloved maestro makes his way to the podium. Max, Max has to do everything. I have to watch the door. Everything. Without Max, nothing happens. Go, go already.
She was supposed to be here at 2 o'clock. Daddy. Oh, well, if worse comes to worse, I guess I can play the wedding march on my saxophone. Daddy. Oh, oh, here she is now. Oh. Father. Not now. I, I have a wedding to attend. Daddy, please stop this. You're acting like you're getting married today instead of me. Me? Oh, no, I'm already married. Besides, your mother wouldn't stand for it. Daddy, please take your Calm down. Everything's going to be fine. Just be calm. under control I haven't a worry where others would hurry I stroll I'm calm I'm cool a gibbering fool is one thing I never become when thunder is rumbling and others are crumbling I hum 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 I must think Fly wings, emerald rings, or a murmuring brook. Murmuring? 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 Look, Daddy, you're calm, you're calm. I haven't a qualm. I'm utterly under control. Let nothing confuse me or faze me. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm calm. Oh, so calm. Oh. Hurry, the minister's here. Oh, the minister's here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm calm, I'm calm, I'm perfectly calm, indifferent to tension and shocks. I'm ruffled and ready, my nerves are as steady as rocks. Calm, controlled, so cool that I'm cold, aloofer than any giraffe. When something's the matter, where others would shatter, I laugh. <laughs> I must breathe deep, ever so deep. Think about sheep going to sleep. Then just count up to ten. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. When you need a plan and one. Cause life is a horrible dream. Just count up to ten very slowly and then one, one two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Everybody's waiting. Scream! Thank you. This is the way I pictured it. <laughs> you out there, me up here, my friend Joe Bussard at the piano. And I always fantasized that one day I would do a show for Robert Klein. <laughs> I fantasize a lot. It helps me get away from myself. I've, one of my great fantasies now is I see myself as a big Las Vegas nightclub star. 
and I see myself on the floor of a glamorous nightclub in Las Vegas, and above me is the revolving, glittering crystal ball, and a white spotlight hits me, and I'm wearing a tuxedo, and I undo my black tie and my collar, cigarette case, few to mention. I did what I had to do and saw it through without exemption. I planned each charted course, each careful step on the byway and more, much more than this. I did it, did it, did it, did it my way. Yes, there were times, I'm sure you knew, when I bit off more than I could chew. I threw it all. When there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. I faced it all, and I stood tall. and cried. I've had my fill, my share of losing. And now, as tears subside, <laughs> I find it all, I find it all so amusing to think, to think I did all that. And may I say, not in a, not in a shy way. Oh, no. No, 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 not me, not me. I did it my way. <laughs> what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he is not. To say the things he truly feels. And at the words of one who kneels, the record shows I took the blows. Mr. Jack Gilford. Hi, and welcome, everybody. Some of the sketches you'll see here this evening were written as far back as the late 20s for such shows as the Zeekfeld Follies, George White Scandals, and for such stars as Fanny Bryce and, uh, Fanny Bryce and Eddie Cantor and Bert Law and Beatrice Slowly and Milton Berle. Strangely enough, we found the sketches are still topical. They still make a statement. They still tell us about us. These sketches still work because, because, well, um, may I speak frankly, because certain things never change. <laughs> people are still people, problems are still problems, something funny is something funny. So, the evening, this evening is about you and me and day-to-day -day affairs. Now, about 30 years ago, I appeared on Broadway at the Winter Garden Theater 
in a musical review called Alive and Kicking. I happen to be part of a sketch called I Never Felt Better. I don't know about the sketch, but I haven't aged a day. <laughs> <laughs> Shopping, Barney. Okay. I'll be back in about an hour. Oh, take your time. Now, don't forget, no cigarettes. When I make up my mind, I make up my mind. I have given up cigarettes for good. And don't you feel better? Better? <laughs> I feel like a new man. And you look so much better since you stopped smoking. I know I do. It's been almost 38 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Darling, I'm proud of you. And you know what? I've been putting on a little weight already. Now, if you're tempted to take a cigarette, what will you say to yourself? Tobacco is a filthy weed, and from the devil doth proceed. It stains your fingers, burns your clothes, and makes the chimney of your nose. <laughs> That's a good boy. It hasn't made you nervous or anything, has it? Nervous? Ridiculous. Run along, dear. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, hi, Barney. Charlie, don't ever ring a doorbell like that. It ain't funny. What's the matter? Don't you feel well? Oh, me? No, no, no. I feel fine. I never felt better. <laughs> I gave up cigarettes, you know. Oh, gee, I wish I could. Oh, there's nothing to it. You feel like a cigarette, just have a piece of candy instead. Really? I, I smoke like a fiend, two packs a day. That's murder. Do you know what it says in this article here? They studied 200 smokers and 200 non-smokers at the University of Pennsylvania. The 200 non-smokers all have good jobs, are happily married, and have an average of two and a third well-adjusted children. <laughs> no kidding. What about the 200 smokers? Every single one of them has dandruff. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Listen, um, Barney, uh, you know that house that you're interested in buying? Yes. Well, I went over and I took a look at it. And yes, I the house. You have a house. And I really think you ought to think it over. I mean, it's a good location. What is, what, 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 what is the house? The house. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, it's close to the station. Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> But, there's a hitch. Well, 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 what's the hitch? Well, they're going to build a garbage disposal garbage plant. Disposal That's plant. right. 